dreamers You're running dry When the flood calls You have no home You have no walls In the thunder crash You're a thousand miles Within a flash Don't be afraid To cry at what you see The act is gone there's only you and me And if we break before the dawn They'll use up what we used to be And good evening and welcome to at Nick Hodge. And my name is Nick Hodge and uh, I'd like to say hello to all of you out there on the internet, on the interwebs listening to me this evening. So uh, you probably have found that um, dealing with Ustream has been a little bit interesting. Uh, the chat seems to be balked. It's been sort of up and down like a uh, brothel on, um, oh, sorry, a prostitute uh, from King Croth or brought it up a prostitute. Yeah, you get the idea. It's been up and down a lot. Um, so please persist. Um, there's some people that will know the IRC stuff, go and look in the Twitter stream or just chat on Twitter or just sit there and watch. Um, or sit there and just remember that Brian Eno music you just heard. More on that in a moment. Um, as you probably are aware, our uh, cats are of Thai extraction. And because they are of Thai abstraction, just like uh, apostrophe Pong, they've been called on to go back to Thailand to spy on drunken bogans attempting to pilfer beer mats so um, we're hi we're renting them out at a rather great rate to do that so you probably won't see any cats this evening for any of you that are at webdu you're probably and not boozing you'll see me again there tomorrow um, but enough of the work stuff and uh, yes i will be finishing in time for stilgarian live there will be a stilgarian live this evening um, where stilgarian will detail a little bit more about this toto project you've probably seen him twitter about um, Toto coming from a variety of different sources, but uh, certainly, um, as Kate Carruthers said, he's not going to be in Kansas anymore very soon. Um, and I think I've, I've put, certainly blogged about this, um, but I think this is probably going to be one of the most interesting and thought-provoking uses of social media yet this year, rather than just uh, fisting uh, products or brand names or company lines on the Twitter and into the social media stream. But enough of that. Um, on to our special guest this evening. Our special guest is Mr. Mark Pesci. Hi, Mark. How are you? <laughs> Very good, thank you. How are you, Nick? Good. I'm just going to put you and your lovely red sweater over there somewhere so that it looks like we're actually talking to each other. It's the magic's of... It looks like I'm working in the ABC where, you know, you have people shifting around and not really feeling right. And the... Anyway, I won't bore people to tears with that. So... Everyone should recognize you and your, your cardigan from New Inventors. I'm not wearing a cardigan tonight. <laughs> what are you wearing, Mark? I'm wearing my Doom t-shirt. Doom? This is my Doom t-shirt from Rocket Car Day. Everyone who knows what Rocket Car Day is knows what this Doom t-shirt is. Okay, so that, that doesn't bode for a very bright future. Uh, this is from, from, from Rocket Car Day 11 because this t-shirt, this t-shirt goes to 11. <laughs> Okay, so and people should also recognise, maybe not the face, but certainly the comments, maybe not even the accent from New Inventors on Twitter, the hash New Inventors, uh, where James introduces you as a lecturer, author, and futurist. And we're going to talk more about the futurist stuff. Now, my first question, which I've been, I've had dozens and dozens of letters about this, is 
is Alison really that hot in real life? You know, we know she's smart because we can hear her words and her thinking, but we don't see her in real life. Is she that hot in real life? Look, I'm not the straightest person in the world, all right? <laughs> and even okay. I think she's hot. Wow, that, that's a big statement. So I would have to say, yeah, she's hot. But you know, even better, she's really, really sweet. That's good. Yeah, you get the smartness. It's, you know, you, and the sweetness sort of, I suppose, comes out in the voice. So, yeah, so that, I, I had to ask that question because, you know, all the people that emailed and let it in, uh, wrote in, um, just me, I had to ask that question. So, and also, just before we get into this this evening, the music choice is all yours, or at least the bands were, and we sort of over the week, you know, backwards and forwards on some of the song choices. Mm. So we had Gary Newman, Peter Gabriel, Robert Fripp, King's, King, Crims, King Crimson from the 1980s version, as you quite clearly stated, David Bowie, Talking Heads, and also Brian Eno. So what does that music mean to you? What it bundled up? What is it? What is it about? What does it say about you? I mean, this was all, this was, was all of a time. They were all, I guess, they were all prog rock, new wave, whatever you want to call them. Um, but they were all of a time, and I remember just when I was sort of growing up into listening to music, that these were the records that I was listening to. I mean, I also listened, mind you, to Never Mind the Bollocks, Here's the Sex Pistols quite a bit. Um, and that was almost, you see, think, think the, bound, the rap background layer. But all the rest of these progressive musicians with their progressive ideas and their progressive sexuality and their progressive whatever you might want to call it, that was a big part of what I was like when I was uh, in high school, when I was in uh, uni. And one of the things in doing the research and sort of, I, you know, I only knew really Gary Newman for Cars and I know that you saw him when he was live here recently and <laughs> Peter Gabriel for So and I've got a, another story about Peter Gabriel music another day. Um, and Talking Heads was sort of a little bit my, my era, but they all these guys all in that electronic and new way and new, new wave stuff actually collaborated a fair bit at that time as well, which I found surprising. Well, yeah, I mean, there is that the whole joke that between Brian Eno and um, Robert Fripp, it was sort of like before there was the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You could do the six degrees of Brian Eno and Robert Fripp and figure out who, because almost everyone who was working at that time in that space had worked with either of them. Yep, so Brian Eno led to Phil Manzanera, who led to Split Ends, who did you know their second uh, album or third album with uh, Phil Manzanera. So that's sort of, I guess, part of that three yeah. levels of, disc, of, of connection. Exactly. Okay, so... A little bit of shared history before we jump into the future stuff. Um, one of the first places you worked at was a company called Shiva. Mm. Um, interesting name. And, and um, my, my connection with Shiva is um, sort of one of the few people in Australia that did much with Apple Talk, Apple Talk Networking. Mm -hmm. Shiva produced uh, or uh, purchased the FastPath box, and, but yeah. also did the dial-in network stuff. Um, and they did some really cool stuff with TCP IP over Apple Talk and sort of did a lot of engineering work um, yeah. historically and earned a lot of money for myself doing that in the yeah. late 80s. And I only found out sort of a year or so ago that you're responsible for some of the UI in the, in the app that yeah. we use to do configuration. All, all the UI for the Shiva product line through 1991 when I left the company was written by me. So... Yeah, so it was, um, I mean, Frank had written, uh, was one of the founders, had written a bunch of it before I came in, but then they, they sort of handed it off to me, and it was my job, and since I really loved Macintosh, and I loved making things very clean Macintosh UI, it was a great, it was a great deal of fun, and actually, of all the jobs I've had, that was, I think, my third or fourth job, of all the jobs I've had where I've worked for other people, that was the most fun job I'd ever had. So, and... It was all developed using Mac app as well. Now, I've actually been warned I'm not allowed to mention that word ever again in your presence, but I just have because <laughs> you're across the other side of Sydney from me, so I can say it. But um, in Mac app in its day, for those developers out there, it didn't have like a UI builder either, did it? Uh, well, it had um, uh, MPW, which is the Macintosh Programming Workshop, which was, you know, not a bad UI back in the day for being able to do things. I mean, for the Macintosh, it was fairly advanced. It wasn't anything like Xcode or any of the wonderful stuff. No, that, no, that we have today. Yeah. yeah. But, Which you know, for the time, it was better than anything you had on Windows at the time. Uh, yeah, well, let's not talk about that. But no. even the, what's interesting is all that Xcode comes from that, that same time. And even that, and we're using it still today. Or, yeah. you know, people developing on the Mac use it today. It's so cool. So, and, you know, then, you know, that the UI stuff led you into VRML and then led you into doing some, you know, lecturing and stuff in VRML. And then sometime in around the year 2000, you're suddenly in Australia. Now, like Zuzu last week, you, your accent isn't obviously Australian and you missed out on a lot of cool Australian music and history. But wh why Australia? What, you know, in the early part of this century? 
Yeah, so it was it was 2003, and I was invited over to give a talk at the um, first Cross Media Lab, which was happening at the Museum of uh, Contemporary Art over in Circular Quay. And I remember this, and I'll, I'll offend the audience a little bit, and I, I apologize, but I'm going to use some bold language. And when I was here on that trip, Sydney really offered me both tits. And I say this in a way, see, here's the thing. In 1991, when I visited San Francisco for the first time, because I made it to almost age 30 without ever having visited San Francisco, San Francisco offered me both tits. And it was a sign that I had to drop everything and move across the country, leave my friends and family behind, and move to San Francisco. And I never regretted that choice for a minute. And when the same thing happened to me when I came to Sydney on that visit in 2003 and moved halfway across the world away from my friends and family, Again, I never regretted the choice, but the cherry on it was I had this great trip and I made some great con content, uh, contacts and I was coming back home through the airport in Los Angeles and in the airport in Los Angeles as I'm going through immigration, there's, you can think of it as a totem pole, a triptych. There are three photographs on the wall in order, George Bush, Cheney, and John Ashcroft. Bing, bang, boom. And if they weren't offering you... <laughs> they weren't offering their tits to you, were they? They, <laughs> they were the stark fist of removal. <laughs> they were the voices telling me to get the fuck out. And so you actually foretold the future and got out of the theocratic, fundamentalist theocratic nation that the United States became for those yes, eight years. Exactly, exactly. And the interesting thing was is that, I mean, since 9-11, America had gone crazy and was under this weird cloud. And Australia was the first trip I'd really gotten out from under that cloud. It felt completely different. Yeah, I was in the U.S. probably about 10 days after September 11 in San Francisco. And having been to the U.S. like 15, 16 times before that and to San Francisco, knowing the general culture, it was a, it's a change. It, it still is, I suppose, in many yeah. ways, a changed nation. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, anyway, it's a, a godforsaken country for many people. So, <laughs> um, now, the first time I met you, I, in, in, in real life, that is, is... A big shout out here to Scenario Girl, Elisa Herod. I was in, you were a, the um, MC at a Jimmy Wales uh, thing for um, uh, for someone. Anyway, it was in, in Melbourne. Education was there. at you, yes. That's right. And so I was sitting in the audience, twittering away, and people asking you, you know, am I on the internet? And I said, yes, I'm here twittering stuff. And they said, what's that? And it was in 2007. And Scenario Girl was one of the people following me. She said, I go up to Mark and say hello. And so I was nervous as shit. I was, re I was packing it because, you know, you're up there on stage, you're in your suit and tie and with Jimmy Wales, who, and, you know, he's not the most pro-Microsoft people of the world. So I was really scared. I went up and said hello, and you sort of were shocked and sort of surprised and um, said hello, say hello back, which I did. So, um, you know, the things you do for uh, ladies on, the, on, the, on Twitter. Uh, you probably don't remember that, do you? I vaguely remember it. I think at okay. that point, I, I was exhausted because we'd actually traversed the entire country. And by, by the time we were in Melbourne, we had traversed the entire country in a week. Yeah, that's pretty big. And yeah. also sort of staying, you know, Jimmy Wales, probably like most, you know, very famous people have an ego. So you're constantly sort of adapting yourself and molding yourself around them. So you're like, a, like cotton wool. Um, you know. uh, I, we, I, at, at that point, I still really hadn't quite gotten the dimensions of Jimmy's ego. And I want to be very careful about what I say since this is being recorded and he may someday hear yeah. it. But um, it's prodigious, yes. And well, you'd, you'd expect that of people in that level. It, it, I think it's pretty universal. Yeah, you know, when we're famous one day, we'll be like that. There's an element of star fucking with Jimmy Wales that was unprecedented, where I actually sat through the pictures of him with Bono and him with... Uh, uh, Richard Branson and him with, oh, it, the, the list went on and on and on. It's like, Jimmy, we already get it. You're famous. You hang out with famous people. But, you know, there it was. Yep. And then, oh, so Desmond I met you Tutu. The... Desmond Tutu, that's right. Desmond Tutu, yes. Absolutely. So, um, met you in the flesh at Bar Camp 2, and, and one of the vision, actually there's a picture somewhere on the interwebs of it, is, is you sitting next to Nathaniel, ba uh, Nathaniel Baum from um, Nathaniel B on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and he had a similar sort of, you know, like uh, coming to Jesus, well, not a coming to Jesus, but sitting next to God sort of thing, as he was sort of very surprised that he could actually speak to you. 
um, sort of a real star at uh, Barcamp, and you'd, you'd actually written some Python and doing some Bluetooth stuff, and you were published it open, you know, as open source, and and I that, that was pretty cool. So, um, I, so as a geek god, you're pretty approachable, approachable, both be, even before Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. So. I mean, you know, I, 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 um, I, you know, it's 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 funny because I don't think of myself. As I mean, it was it was weird when the VRML stuff happened because people would start to approach me differently, and I actually met up with one of my friends. I had coffee with one of my friends about a year after the whole VRML thing had happened, and she said to me, quite frankly, I didn't think you were going to want to hang out with us anymore because we're not famous. And I just never got it. I just like never really understood what she was talking about. Why would I change? Why would anything change? Yeah. So you know. Fame is an interesting thing, especially when people come up to you. You probably have a better memory for people than I do, but um, yeah, you, you remember someone's face, and it takes you about fifteen seconds to remember their name. And the first name I generally remember these days is their Twitter ID. So yeah, exactly. Uh, oh yeah, you're so and so from Twitter, and you're crispy noodles. For that was the problem. I had I had you know when we had the stub up on my roof a few weeks ago, it would have helped me so much if people were wearing their Twitter IDs because I can't remember any of those fox names. And you, they also their picture of their avatar on their shoulders. So yeah, well, that would help too. <laughs> uh, so it'd be interesting to see Leslie Nasser wandering around because he'd have, he'd have sort of two faces, both Conroy's and his. But anyway, that's another story. So what does a futurist do? Let's get into the guts of this. What does a futurist do? Is there a future in being a futurist? Uh, yeah, there's, gonna, there's a, probably a hell of a future in being a futurist, although I don't want to uh, crowd up the market with cheap imitations. Um, Okay, you know, it's funny because in preparing for this interview, I sort of, I thought about this, uh, I guess, a great deal more analytically than I have before. And what a futurist does is, if they're, if they're doing it for real and they're not doing it for fake, and uh, ignore all futurists who say in 20 years, blah, 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 because in 20 years, uh, people won't be able to track you down and tell you what you said was wrong, all right? In 20 years, we're all going to have jetpacks and flying cars and fish will talk. Yes, okay, that's what's going to happen in 20 years. I don't think so. Instead, what I think a futurist does is a futurist helps to interpret the present because at a very basic level, the seeds of the future are already in the present. And a futurist is someone who helps, helps you identify those seeds and helps you identify how those seeds are growing and whether they're in good ground or in bad ground and whether they're going to take off or not. That's at a at basic level what a futurist does. A futurist looks at the present. So is it a surprise to many of the people you communicate to that, you know, when you're talking about the future with the seeds in the present, that they aren't, real, they aren't tripping over those seeds, that they're not seeing them? What, what makes people not really see what's going on around them? So one of my heroes, Marshall McLuhan, and I would advise everyone to go out and read Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, which was written in 1963 and is still a fantastic book and is still, um, I think, a great guide to what goes on in the world. And one of the things that McLuhan said is that essentially everyone's looking backward. The entire culture is looking backward and people are looking backward. Artists are the only people who look and live in the present. And that the, pro the, the job of the artist is to interpret the present for people who are looking behind themselves. So, in fact, the futurist is ahead of the pack because the futurist is looking at the present, not looking at the future, because almost everyone else is looking but not behind themselves. So that's why they don't see what's in the present. That's why they don't see to the present. It's because they're looking at what happened last week, last month, last year, 10 years ago when they were born. So the way you put it is that, another way to put it is a driving a car very fast looking in the rearview mirror. Yes, exactly. And hoping you don't hit a brick wall along the way. Yep. Okay, so the, you know, and, and to get the, the zeitgeist, the, you know, what's happening now, where do you get that from? Do you, is it something you just sort of, it comes to you when, you know, I know you practice a lot, yoga a lot, at least you say you're so in Twitter, so I'll take it as true, uh, being the authentic, transparent guy that you are. Um, <laughs> yeah, trust me, I don't make it up. <laughs> yeah, so where does it come from? Where does, where does the, where do the, where do the seeds, the Coens, where the tr bits of truth come from? I mean, so, some of it's funny because some of it does come from meditation. It really does. You quiet the mind and things bubble up when you're, you know, when you're trying to quiet your mind down, that's when your ideas will start bubbling up and it's a pisser because that's precisely when you don't want a good idea is when you're trying to meditate and empty your head. But sometimes it happens. But um, I'll give you a for example. And the for example is, is uh, it's a bit of a story. I was speaking at a conference on Friday at the Crown Casino in Melbourne. 
and I was talking to some school teachers because I've been talking a lot to teachers. And this is in a very small group. There was three of us talking. And one of these teachers has two children, and one of her children is in year three. And I was asking them whether students in year five, year four, year three had mobiles. And she said, let me tell you. The teacher in my classroom asked all the kids who had mobiles to, to raise their hand. And my child came home and said, I was the only one who didn't have a hand raised. I was the only one in that classroom without a mobile. This is year three. Year three. Wow. Now, apparently this is a relatively affluent community, a relatively affluent school. But this is year three. Now, as soon as I heard this, I was immediately obsessed with what are these year three students doing with their mobiles? Is it just something they're using to call mom and dad when they need to be picked up from soccer practice? Are they sending text messages? Who are they sending text messages to? How is that different from year four, year five, year six, year seven? I was immediately obsessed with this. Now, this was, I, I don't know if this is all futurological, except it is, because it's, all, it's something about what's going on in the present. But I wanted to study this, because if I, I wanted to study this, because I knew that if I could study this, I would have a roadmap to how these kids are growing up and how these, how these devices are changing the way these kids are growing up. So that's, I think that's part of it. And the other part of it is just, Sometimes patterns will form. You'll be looking at stuff, and I do a huge amount of reading every day, reading four or five hours, whether it's Slashdot or the New York Times or The Economist or whatever it might be. Read, read, read. And all of a sudden, something you'll just come across, and the picture will, will snap into place. The penny will drop, and you'll go, okay, wait, this is a trend. I can understand this. This is something that's going on right now. So it's sort of like getting we, you know, weaving the, the threads that are through all these different things in – to some sort of, dare I say, mega trend, and I see Stilgarian's already lamenting that he has did not set up a a, uh, a Mark Pesci buzzword bingo on this show, and we, I did actually mention that we <laughs> how could we avoid that? But, that son of a bitch! Oh yeah, I was just not going to watch his show anymore, even though I was actually on it for three hours as a token gay person over over Eurovision. But that's in the past. Um, uh, so inside every straight man, there's a little gay man coming at, trying to get out. So and, it, and it happens during Eurovision. You're absolutely right. For me, it happens during Eurovision. So how, how do you actually, you know, back on the future stuff, how, or, you know, how do you do that pro, yeah, sort of extending what's happening now into the future you know, to working out what's going to happen in the future with any degree of confidence? I, I mean, I think in some sense it's a confidence game. All right. In some sense, you just have to believe in the results yourself, whether or not they're true. I think in some sense, it's a confidence game. But I think the other side of that is to base your prognostications, your theories, in as much obser observational data as possible. I think that that's the key. That if you can say, look, it, there's this fact and this fact and this fact and this fact. Therefore, this is happening. That is probably the safest way to play your game. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, sometimes I jump to conclusions. And I jump to conclusions because this is what I believe, not because I absolutely know it's true. And so do you do a review? Do you, like like um, some of the stuff I'm reading at the moment is to do with risk and uh, stock analysis and that sort of stuff, for some, some stuff I'm going to do in a couple of weeks. Is there... Do you sort of hit a point point? you go, well, okay, so... What did I say you know, a year or two years ago and, and you know, oh, that yeah. correct your path? Nick, I invite your entire viewing audience to go and view Piracy is Good, which has been up on YouTube since four years ago when I recorded it. I recorded it in, pardon me, so four, yes, four years ago. So May 2005 is when I shot it. Maybe May, two, was it May 2005? May 2004? I forget. I think it's 2005 now. It's four years ago, I think. Anyway. I predicted everything was going to happen with television and with the internet and uh, the torrents and embedding advertising in television, blah, 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 blah. I got it all dead right. So I, I have left a trail in my written work and in my spoken work, which people can look at. And then you take a look at the telephone repair handbook, which was this idea of how to fix the mobile phone. And then take a look at what happened with the iPhone interface and how much of that I correctly predicted. So, yes. I can, I can, I do in fact reassess, and it's always very nice when I can see. Okay, this is happening, and this is happening, and this is happening, and I predicted it here, here, and here. So yeah, 
So yes, I can do that. And that's one of the reasons why I don't like playing the 20 years out game or, or even the mega trends game. Because that's, you know, sort of, okay, you're going to go look at a huge trend. Toffler was very good. And I know we'll probably talk about Toffler in a little yeah. bit. Toffler was very good about talking about mega trends. I'm talking about trends. And they're important trends. And they're big trends. But I'm not trying to talk about mega trends. <laughs> and so did you copy your idea of, you know, what's happening with TV and media from the Talking Head song we played? Found <laughs> well, it's really funny because... That's one of my favorite, I mean, I've got a lot of favorite Talking Head songs, but that really is one of my favorite Talking Head songs because it's so sweet and because it's got that basic line, if your work isn't what you love, then something isn't right. You know, that basic line that is so true. And yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't until years later I realized that they were talking about, yeah, making up their own shows and putting them on TV. Absolutely. Wait a minute. That's what we're talking about here. I actually dropped those quotes not just into a talk that I gave at Web Directions, but into, I think, a talk that I was giving to TV people. You know, at some point during the line, I dropped that in there. I don't know. It might probably went right over their heads. I think a lot goes over the heads of TV people. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to get Still Garian on uh, q and I reckon he would really upset their knickers, something yeah. chronic, if they, if they can have... Tony Abbott on there, you know, every second week they, you know, they need to still get in to balance out the yeah. right wing, you know, opiate day crappery. So in Melbourne, we talked about Melbourne in a moment ago, and you were in Melbourne last week and over the weekend. And earlier this week we had the Future Summit or Hash Future Summit, as we saw it in Twitter, right. uh, appear, you know, in Melbourne. And one of the things that I, I said a couple of things in the Twitter stream, some of which sort of half got me into trouble at work, but I quipped that there were no futurists at Future Summit. Uh, there might have been later, but I, I think I was being quite cynical that I day. think there were a lot of economists at the Future Summit. Okay, right. Well, it's sort of economy is sort of one of the things that people are rather concerned about right now because we don't have one. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and there's sort of certainly a lot of people talking about, uh, you know, green economy and that sort of stuff. But when what was interesting is you when Duncan Riley posted his observation on in Inquisitor, you know, he being a... You know, a digital modern day startup person uh, in a, in in Melbourne, in Australia, his perspective was that this you know our digital future is pretty fucked. Essentially, is the summary of what he's saying because no one gets it. And you said you cringed at cringed at that. Did you cringe at the accuracy of that? No, no, no. I I cringed at the um, brazenness, the the lack of faith that that actually portrayed because. I live two blocks from this set of offices where Polonizer and Mo something and something something, I forget, there's three little startup mobile companies that are working hard over there. And, you know, Mick Le Levinskis, who was at the Future Summit, was, is there, Phil Morrill is there, um, Greg, uh, Keith Ahern is there, and they're all working their butts off. And they're working their butts off, and they don't care whether they have any funding from the Commonwealth or from the states or anything else. They're just working their butts off, and they have nice, sustainable businesses. And, you know, I look at that, and then I tell Duncan Riley to shut the fuck up because he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about because I got this, these people doing this stuff right here. And you know what? They're doing it because they want to do it and because they know they can do it and because they know they can make a business out of it. And it doesn't take a, you know, an economist to tell them that, and it doesn't take a government to give them a handout. What's so, interesting, though, is that I wouldn't call Duncan, and he, he's probably not listening, but he might listen to this afterwards, the, the most interventionist of, if economically, interventionist of people. I think he was, and he wasn't, I don't know if he was talking specifically about the government. I think it was just the general feel, the general vibe. So, but it, it won't go down that path too far, I don't think, and argue the point either way. But uh, I no, guess sort of get it, your it perspective. It just seemed to me, it, it did seem like he was actually arguing that the state doesn't believe in these businesses, so therefore these businesses aren't going to take off, which to me is just ass backward. That's, that's part of my Americanness coming out. When Americans have a, a health, healthy um, distrust of government. Yeah, and we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago sort of on the constitution stuff in Australia and all, yeah, that sort of stuff. But uh, I think that another whole topic for another time because mm. we'll end up going down a different path. So do you think people are hooked on the past like a drug? Is, is it a, like a drug to them? Well, it's, it is comfortable. Even, the, even failure is comfortable. That's the thing. I mean, you know, I'm now in a lot of therapy. <laughs> Let me tell you, a lot of therapy. And, of course, one of the things about therapy is that you have to become unhooked from the parts of you that are unhealthy. And it's really hard to do that because you're really, because even though the things are unhealthy and bad for you, you're comfortable with them. 
And, you know, you need to find that level of agitation. You need to be able to find that level of discomfort and be able to live with that level of discomfort to have a successful life in the present. And that's true whether you're in therapy or whether you're trying to be a futurist. Okay. Um, that's not what I go to therapy for, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's why I go to therapy. That's okay. We all go for different reasons. Yes. But, uh, um, so, one of the things, you, the other thing sort of in your day job is you're, you're a lecturer. And so, one of the recent um, uh, lectures you, you put up was, um, you know, Steal This Lecture, I think it was, which was something yes. you did at the University of New South Wales, yeah, and published on, on Vidler. Um, do the students, you know, that this, this connected generation, as, uh, as Dana Boyd would call them, or Generation Y, do they get what they have hold of right now, where they are? It, that's a really good question, and it's hard to give you an answer. They don't have insight into how magnificent the current era is. They don't have insight because they didn't live in another era, and therefore there is nothing they can compare it to. So they don't have insight to that. It was interesting because, you know, part of Steele, this lecture, is a whole digression on Douglas Engelbart. Douglas Engelbart, the man who invented the mouse, is a way to create a manipulation system for hypertext, which he created as a system to be able to augment human intellect. And no, it wasn't invented by Apple. Yeah. Well, I mean, people, kids probably don't even think about it. Every computer no, no. Has, always has, has always had a mouse. It's always had windows, right? They, and it's for these kids, because these kids, remember, these kids were born in 1990. So for these kids, every computer has also always had a web browser. So the reign of Engelbart for these kids is complete. All right. So they have all the tools they need for intelligence augmentation. They don't realize that they're living in a world that Douglas Engelbart created in the Joint uh, Fall Computer Conference in 1968. But yet, that's what I explained to them, that there was a beginning and that this beginning was about being able to augment human intellect. And that's the era that we're living in now, that the era of share this lecture is the era of augmented human intellect. And so what impact is that going to have um, on, on people, on, on, on sort of the, the, not, you know, the future and the, ne the next you know, few years? What, yeah, what is the impact of that? that well, okay. Here's the, the, here's the metaphor, and I'm, I'm going to work this metaphor for a while until it's beaten into the ground. But if I get known for this metaphor, this is fine. All right. In about 150 years ago, someone figured out that you could take a steam engine and you could hook it up to a shovel. And you could then move huge amounts of earth really, really effectively. And so you could take human energy and multiply it a thousandfold and create the steam shovel. And the steam shovel literally transformed the human landscape because it was all of a sudden possible for a puny human being with nothing more than a lot of energy, a lot of coal at that time to work with, to completely reshape the, the landscape. Now, let me go off camera for a second. Here, and you'll, you'll get it on your videos in a couple of seconds. I'm holding up my iPhone next to my head. This is the steam shovel of the 21st century. And every single one of us is holding it in our pocket. Every single one of us has this incredible amplifier, not just for connectivity, but for the ability to share. And this is the thing that the kids don't quite realize they have. But this is the thing that's going to change the world. And it's already busily changing the world. So, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, the argument goes many levels beyond that. And I can go and digress into it at any level possible. But it's, at one very simple level, that's all you really need to say about it. Is it's just that that device, which is now ubiquitous, where we now have over half of the people on planet Earth, 4 billion people now have mobile phones on planet Earth, or maybe 3.6 billion. But 10% of them have more than one account. 3.6 billion people and counting have mobile phones. More than half the planet have them. And that's now, so more than half the planet have these incredible amplifiers. And the amplification is as profound as the muscle amplification that came along with the steam shovel. Okay, you've just described the technology. What sort of, you know, impacts that that have, you know, the... 
you know, the, the site that you sent us to earlier this week that's wasted, you know, three or four hours of my week, and I'll be sending the bill later, <laughs> is the... Don't send it to me, send it to Steve Ballmer. Uh, yeah, I'll send it to Steve, the bill to Steve, or whatever. Um, but it was sort of people oversharing <laughs> to a certain I... extent. That While they were texts or whatever, it was still quite an interesting thing to read. Right. That, that's probably one negative of it. But, that, but that, uh, that's not that, that's okay. That's the sharing of culture. I mean, I've broken down sharing into three basic sort of axes. One is the sharing of culture, and the sharing of culture is the thing that's decimated the music industry and, to a lesser extent, the television and film industries. But it's also created things like that site that I passed around, which is what is it? Uh, was it text from last night? I think is the name of yeah. it. Yeah, text from last night. Um, it, that's the sharing of culture. And then you have you step up a level or step across a level and you have the sharing of knowledge and you have Wikipedia. And the thing that we don't really fully grasp about Wikipedia is that every single individual who uses Wikipedia can potentially now be as intelligent as the smartest individual who's written a Wikipedia entry. So that that is, I mean, everything that Engelbart wanted to happen about intelligence augmentation is now pre present in Wikipedia and all the systems that are building themselves like Wikipedia along Wikipedia lines. And then you move up one level or across one level from that and you now have systems for sharing power. So you now have incredible transparency being applied to all the systems of institutions or all the institutions of governance and that this transparency is having an incredibly both corrosive and yet propellant effect on all of these institutions and that this is now effectively changing the rules for how power flows and it's happening in educational institutions it's happening in governmental institutions it's happening in economic institutions it doesn't matter and all of this is because of this basic process of sharing and at some level there's this little device sitting down here which is enabling all of it and it's not always this device it could be a desktop it could be something else but it is at some level this device yeah, it's, it's being permanently connected wherever you are. Yeah, yeah, um, permanently connected uh, and permanently sharing. Yeah, and either video and pictures as well as you know the visual stuff as well as the the textual sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. And so that's happening now. Yes. And, but then the sort of the pragmatist in me says, well, where's the impact on the now, especially from a political perspective? Um. Okay, so Obama passed the big stimulus package. That was he did that in what the first couple of weeks that he was president, and part of the stimulus package, just a few million dollars, was money that was allocated so that uh, I believe it's called um, Restore.gov. I believe is the URL. It's now a website that's designed to track how all of that $740 billion gets spent, which has never happened with a federal package before. So the package comes with its own website, which will now transparently show people where all their money's going. And of course, at the federal level, it's very easy to be transparent. But as that money reaches now out to the state level and to the local level, those levels become increasingly less transparent because, as we all know, the closer you get to a local level of governance, the more backslapping, the more insular, the more who you know, and let's make a deal here, it all becomes. And so there's now pushback from the lower levels of governance, from the higher levels of governance, as Obama tries to implement his vision because the lower levels of governance don't want it. And yet, we now have things like the Sunshine Organization, the Sunshine uh, it's the Sunshine something or other. It's Sunshine Organization, which are now also applying these same principles. They're collecting all of the data around where all the congressmen are getting their money from, where all the congressmen are getting their funding from. So they can now shine a light on why these congressmen are voting particular ways because they're getting money from the recording industry or from the petrochemical industry or from the banking industry or whatever it might be. And so it's, yes, we have a comment from Coda, corruption rules. Yes, corruption rules, but now we actually can have the antiseptic for the corruption, which is to shine that light, which is transparency. So, yeah, when you look at it historically, Obama's been pretty brave, as brave as, say, letting women vote or uh, letting Aboriginals to be counted as human beings or, you know, uh, go on through parliamentary history where the power shifts and that's actually that's... the people in power that affect that. Do, you know, if putting this in a little bit of an Australian context as much as, you know, a little nation doesn't really matter that much, do you see, you see any hopes on the horizon for that occurring here? Well, I mean, I think the, the interesting thing is, is that it doesn't take um, 
anyone, although Obama's doing a good job being a leader in this, it doesn't really require that sort of leadership. The leadership it requires is the leadership from underneath. It requires the kind of leadership that would take individual citizens who are concerned enough about something to keep their eye on something. And it's interesting because I think that the Greens are very cleverly aligning themselves with this entire sort of movement forward into transparency. I mean, you listen to Bob on any particular night on the television as he's talking about this. Yes, we should have more transparency about how the MPs are spending their $32 million in uh, or $8 million, whatever it is, in residence funding a year or uh, in whatever they get to spend in their constituencies, blah, 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 blah. Keep on shouting, 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 more transparency, more transparency, more transparency, because transparency is the thing that will transform governance. And transparency isn't something that can be avoided. It isn't something because unless you're going to pull away and become a police state, transparency is part of the tenor of the times. Sharing is part of the tenor of the times. Let me tell you a little story, Nick. Please do. Last year, when I was going to the Personal Democracy Forum, I was flying from San Francisco to Boston. And I haven't flown in an American airport for a couple of years. It's been a couple of years since I've been home. And I'm sitting there and United is changing our departure gate and delaying things and they're not really telling us anything. And finally I decided, and I had my N95 with me before the iPhone came out, and I decided I was going to photograph these beautiful screens that United has installed in the terminal and SFO so that keep you up to date with everything that's going on. And I'm photographing these screens. And I, I think nothing of it. And um, then as we're getting on the plane, a woman who I'd been talking to earlier came up to me and says, you know, this other woman who we'd also been talking to got really nervous when you were photographing the screens. And I was photographing the screens, by the way, and uploading them to Flickr from my phone because I could do that, you know, because you do. You take a phone, mm, photo, you yep. upload it to Flickr, you take a photo. And she, I'm, I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? Why was she nervous? Well, who knows why you were taking photographs of the screens? And I just lost my temper. I lost my temper and I said, this is the reason I left America. If you wanted to sum it up, <laughs> this kind of paranoia is the reason I left America. But it, it was interesting because what it actually really pointed out was that she, what I was doing was photographing and sharing this information. This is the thing that the system as constructed can't withstand. This is the thing that the system is constructed is going to have to re-figure itself to be able to deal with because you won't be able to turn down the sharing. You won't be able to stop the sharing. Yes, and I sort of tried to coin the term hyper-sharing, but you said it was too clumsy, so I have to think of another <laughs> well, I remember these things. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I think hyper-connectivity is pretty damned uh, clumsy too, but... I, w I think um, someone just got... Um, bingo on the chat, so that's good. So someone uh, still guarantees someone five dollars. So you, we talked. You talked a little bit about in the terms of the futurists. You sort of have looked at a little bit of uh, Alvin Toffler, who's sort of the futurist of futurists. Yeah. And, and I certainly, you know, in doing research for the show, went back and actually looked at some of the stuff he had written and how prescient or how yes. how true some of that stuff is. Um, I think. Uh, is is uh, is actually you know quite amazing when you look at that, but one of the people that's sort of confused me a little bit is Marshall McLuhan mm. and his concept of and I, I get this wrong and it's and I still get it wrong which is understanding this the medium is the message, um, yes. and which I take you know, when I read about it and that sort of stuff is that the form of a medium embeds itself in the message, or the cultures of technology. Are in the linguistics or in the language used in that technology. Well, I mean, the message comes. Go for it. I'm sorry. Go for it. To explain what McLuhan was on about. Well, I mean, I mean, the thing is, is you can see it really clearly in um, in a lot of our technological devices. For instance, the culture of the command line, the culture of Linux and the command line, is very different from the culture of, say, Macintosh and the GUI, and. Uh, the way the, the interfaces that are presented by our devices shape the way we think about them. They shape the way we can think about them. And you can take, you can go back to the alphabet. And McLuhan says that the alphabet was completely different from the uh, pictographic systems that preceded it. You know, it allowed us to think very linearly because you place all these characters on a line, and then your mind starts to follow the line, and your brain starts to follow the line, and the eye starts to follow the line, and you start to think, oh, one thing follows another. And so all of a sudden you develop this culture of causality from the fact that you started to place your characters next to each other on a line. 
So that's, at one level, that's the medium is the message. And it doesn't matter whether it's a motion picture or a cartoon or a television signal or a radio. Each of these things have their own way that they shape the way you approach them. And so um, I mean, there's this line, I'm trying to remember, it's in McLuhan, I'm trying to remember what it is, but it's, um, as the organs of perception are shaped, so they shape perception. And um, I, I, I've misquoted it, but it, but it's, it, it really it, it sums it up. And so it's a very, rather than being a technological approach, it's a very almost philosophical and psychological approach to thinking about it. That, in fact, when you're sitting at a computer, you're accepting a whole bunch of rules about how information is structured on that screen. And you can see this because we come to certain websites and they're delightful and they elicit a certain joy because the way they've structured the information they're presenting feels very good or feels very bad, feels very hard. And we're getting sides of this all the time when we explore the different interfaces on the web or the different interfaces on our computer. But if you leave the computer behind and go to your automobile, where it, which has a completely different set of interfaces, right, then you're really, then you're getting a sense of why the medium is the message. So in the tw in Twitter that you know the in you know the 140 character limitation drives a certain mm. style of mode of communication which is quite interesting yeah. in and of itself um, which I'm sure other people or people smarter than me will write about over time um, and they'll probably look at Still Garian's tweets and wonder what the fuck's going on but I'll leave that to them. Uh, they'll be dig digging Still Garian's tweets out of the <laughs> apocalyptic ruins. <laughs> Our civilization. Yep. 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 And uh, wondering what was going on there. Um, and sort of one of the questions that popped up in the in the in the chat is, you know, with pictographic languages, which is like Chinese, yeah. you know, they think much more visually, and and it, it elicits a particular way of thinking that's very different to our English, yeah. you know, romantic um, way of thinking. And I actually read a theory, and it's probably on some conspiracy site that Kate Carruthers sent me to, dropping names all over the place here, where. The reason why the Germans followed Hitler so much in the 1930s is because the verb is at the end of the language. So you had to really sit and listen to all the nouns, 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 waiting to work out what you were going to do with these nouns till the end. And that sort of generated a sort of a right. cult program. Yeah. The, the other side of it, is, and, and McLuhan says this, was that the rise of Hitler was directly proportional to the rise of the public address system. That in fact, the, oh, the, yeah. rise, yes, the rise of the public address system, because you had to have the... Uh, what you would call the valve, I would call the tube amplifier. You had to have that, and that, that tubes and valves weren't manufactured in any numbers until the late 20s. And so you couldn't have public address systems as we would think of them until the late 20s when you have radio public address systems. So Hitler and the message Hitler was sending was particularly well attuned to public address and radio transmission. That's McLuhan. Great. So one of the other things that you talked about late last year um, at uh, Web Direction South was, uh, um, I'll let you pronounce it, anarcho-syndicalism. Oh, anarcho-syndicalism, there you go. You see, you did it fine. I, I, yeah, I've, I've been practicing the difficult words because in, in some of the earlier shows I messed up, it comes from my country English this country school English where I mix all sorts of weird things up and that sort of stuff. So what were you on about? You're wearing the red. Right. And probably some black somewhere. What the fuck were you on about? Okay. Um, Anarcho-syndicalism. All right. Let's, let's just assume that things are going to go on as they are and that the concentrations of power are going to be eroded more and more frequently and more and more completely by the different sort of configurations of transparency and people getting together and, and to, in order to accomplish certain goals. Once you have enough power melted down into sort of these ponds of power, well, how do we get things done after that? How do people work? And I, th this, was, this was me really putting my futuristic, my futurological hat on. How do we actually work as a culture once all of the, the, the locuses of power have been melted down by this, by this, um, to this tsunami of transparency and sharing? Well, it's going to be human beings who are gathered together in voluntary organizations who will share, who will share their culture, who will share their knowledge, and who will share their power with one another to be able to accomplish whatever goals. And those goals may be different from another group who decide to share their power, their knowledge, and their culture in pursuit of a different set of goals. And those groups may do battle. Those groups may choose to cooperate. 
in a larger set of organizations. And so the closest thing that I could find is a to a political philosophy that exists now that explains how all that works is anarcho-syndicalism, where people are voluntarily associating. That's the key there. It's a voluntary association. There's no coercion because when we melt this power down, and power is rapidly melting down in this culture. This is the thing that's happening right now that I tend not to talk about because I try not to scare people. All right, But power is rapidly melting down in, in culture right now. It is not quite Chernobyl, but it is yes, one of the things, yeah, when you read um, uh, some of the latter stuff from Toffler, he talks about, you know, this, the, the power shift and still, and then sort of the power is then in the hands of people who have, have the knowledge. Yeah. What we're actually seeing is post Toffler, post power shift, where everyone has the knowledge and everyone has the information, what, and where information you know, Sun Tzu history and history says is power. Suddenly, when everyone has that, as you say, transparency, you're right. It, we, we, it's it, the world's pretty different. Right, right. The war and the world runs along different lines. And now, the battles are over different groups of people who are battling over maybe resources, maybe over mind share. Who knows? I mean, obviously, some of it's going to be over resources because. The thing that we already know about the 21st century is that it's resource constrained in a way that the 20th century wasn't. Yeah. So, so some of that's. Uh, I don't think that we're going to end up like Mad Max, which, uh, on the other hand, when I talk to Kate Seeking, uh, Kate Carruthers, half the time I think, okay, maybe, maybe we've got Mad Max coming. But if we don't have Mad Max coming, what we do, what we will see, are groups of people who will be voluntary, co voluntarily cooperating to make the most out of limited resources. Yep, and so in the software world, which is probably one of the first worlds to experience this because it's all not physical stuff, we you know, have the traditional proprietary companies, of which my employer is one, yeah. and there are many others, but we also have the open source model, which is much more of the model of you know, what you're talking about in terms of decoupled, spread out sort of power and information. Right. And one of the things that would be interesting is to see that similar deconstruction um, appear in things like marketing, in, so in, in things like, we're already seeing it in media, so you know, that's slowly dying, but in marketing, in, in, in politics, and in economics as well, you know, where those traditional structures get deconstructed by the right. transparency and the, the power shift. Have you seen any sort of images of that or sort of felt any current sort of tremors of that at the moment, uh, in, into present day? Well, I mean, if you think about it, it's funny because I, I, in 1995 I gave an interview uh, in which I stupidly said that Microsoft would not be around in five years. And I stupidly said that because I misstated the point. What I actually meant to say was that Microsoft wasn't going to matter in five years. Because by the year 2000, the game had left the operating system. It was all about the browser. And the yep. browser is the transparent open platform. Yep. And it, it, that, that hasn't changed. And so, you know, you can have Linux going on on the side and it's great and it's wonderful and you can have Firefox going on and it's great and it's wonderful. But those are, um, those are entrees. They are not the mains. The mains are what's happening inside the browser, and all of that's transparent and open and shared. And all of that's mm. accelerating so quickly now that every day we see something that's amazing, new, wonderful, powerful, and, and impressive. I mean, I only found TalkBox a couple of days ago, and apparently one of my friends sent me an invitation as soon as it got up, and TalkBox blew my mind. You know, uh, Cameron uh, Riley was using it to do his show the other day, and he had nine or ten people in there giving video at the same time, and it was amazing, and it was all kind of sort of working, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Yeah. yeah. If, if, you, if you've got a mind like Cameron's where you can actually juggle that, I'd do it. <laughs> no, Cameron just doesn't listen to anyone else. It's very simple. I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> so what's the one thing, just to close off this evening, because we do have to hand over to uh, Mr. Stilgarian, um, What's the one thing you're looking at now? What's the thing that's tickling your ghoulies right now? Uh, I, I come back to this story about the children and their mobile phones. Um, I have made a promise to myself, which we'll see if I keep. But if I live, uh, I had made a promise to myself that I was going to go pursue a PhD this year. And I think that I found the perfect topic for a PhD, which is to simply be an anthropologist and study what these year three students are doing with their mobile phones and the year two students and the year one students because some of them probably have them and the year four students and the year five students. So right. like a seven up but of, of mobile phones. Yes, but do it as a pure constructivist. I mean, one of my big influences is Sherry Turkle 
And Sherry Turkle is a constructivist to take a look at how computers change the way children think. And so the same thing's going to be true for the mobile. It, you know, if you hand them this sharing device, this sharing amplifier, and you hand it to them when they're really young, how, do they, how does it incorporate into their ontology? How does it incorporate into how they see the world? That's what I'm all about right now. Cool. So on that note, Mark, I uh, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. That's cool. And uh, so uh, I'm just going to take you off screen here for a moment as we hand over to, um, as I just finish off and hand over here. So if we could get someone, get someone to read us the future with certainty, we would certainly leap at the chance. It impacts our lower base needs, our Maslowian needs of security and safety, knowing knowing what the future holds gives us a, a comfort in our present. Ultimately, the future may, the only thing, may be the only thing we humans cannot touch, see, or cannot measure, and for the masses, cannot directly affect. The role of a futurist is a modern-day equivalent of a Celtic druid, an Indian shaman, a gypsy fortune teller, someone who sees the present through different glasses and extrapolates a non-Wolframic line of potentiality, someone that is somewhere that is not known and not in our present mind. By the sheer act of shining a light in one dim dark corner of the future, the cockroaches scuttle out and there is a potential that a future, futurist has Heisenberged out, Heisenberged out of reality. A futurist has a challenging act. In a small way, they are a court jester. Not the clown, but the only person who is freely permitted to speak their mind. Call the present for what it is and determine the health of Schrodinger's cat. In what dramatic ways will the present change our potential future? Risk can be described as, a myriad of, uh, as worrying about a myriad of things that can happen, but ultimately only a few of those things will happen, and knowing the future reduces that risk, and detailing a potential future helps us tickle out all the potential futures and work out what the risk is, good and bad. Futurists such as Mark have this responsibility to shake up the people and the people in power and in the present to ensure that a negative future is averted and we all journey down a clean path through a dark forest of reality. So there'll be no uh, at Nick Hodge next week or the week probably. I'm sort of going to take a hiatus for a couple of weeks. Uh, please go over to Stilgarian Live. Uh, he, I know he'll be talking more about his big Toto adventure. Um, but for now, let's hear some David Bowie. <laughs> 